The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. 30 years ago, a young entrepreneur, excited by the coffee culture he saw overseas, opened up a small mobile coffee cart. Over the next years, he helped to create and define the cafe scene that New Zealand first became famous for and then exported to the world. Michael Aubress is marking 30 years in business this year, over which time they expanded from the cart to their own roastery, cafes, a network of cafes they supplied, and then international expansion to Australia, the UK, Japan and Singapore. It's taken partnerships, innovation, some Kiwi can-do attitude, risk and spending time to incubate the same culture they had here, there. And if you take a step back, it's kind of bananas what they helped accomplish. A country that had no cafe or coffee culture 30 years ago ended up being so influential in the food scenes of the world's greatest cities that you can now travel anywhere and the Kiwi flat white and cafe approach is now ubiquitous. To talk, helping make an industry, the journey to here and what's next, Michael Albrecht joins us now. Kia ora, good morning. Ah, good morning, Simon. Thanks for having me. Ah, thank you for being here. So, first up, um, tell us how it was you came to, to love coffee. Oh, I think as a, as a kid growing up in Milford um, in the 70s, uh, my, my mother was quite, um, she, she explored a lot of different foods and... Um, and uh, we, I think whilst uh, whilst my contemporaries were probably eating white bread and drinking instant coffee, we had we had brown bread. In fact, Mum cooked, baked her own bread, and we always had roast and ground in in the house, which I imagine is pretty rare at that time. I think it was. I mean, we're, we're a British colony, a nation of tea drinkers. Um, coffee wasn't huge, I, I don't think, in our historical culinary culture, but. Um, that um, that was just something that I think um, my mother it was a it was a luxury and it was it was more expensive. So I, I don't quite um, understand how I might actually just valued the the product. I guess to have that that um, aroma in the house, and she was probably addicted to the caffeine as well. <laughs> and even before you started uh, All Press and the coffee cart, you had some kind of late night venture. Is that right? Slinging coffees. Oh, you've really done your research, haven't you? You've gone back. You've gone back way back into the past. You're referring to the Hubcap Cafe, perhaps. Yeah, yeah that was that was a pr- pretty crazy time um, in the sort of red light district of of uh, K Road. Um, that, yeah, we we poured a lot of coffee. The, the coffee machine kept that business alive, and we were but we were also making moussakas and and other you know great food for. For the night workers and the musicians and anyone staying up late, to cab, cabbies and yeah, it was a pretty wild um, little shop. And what was it that led you from that cafe and that kind of uh, that life to find yourself in Seattle and getting inspired by 
the daytime coffee culture? Um, I, I did. Um, I, I, I always was uh, interested in the American diner, and um, I did a JV. I was, I was quite young. I was 20, 25. I didn't have any money, but um, I partnered up with um, a chap called Jim McIntosh, and we we were going to create the Auckland Diner on the corner of Merrill Drive. Um, we had a complication with, um, I think there were some um, issues around finance, but the project went on hold and I went, well, I'll go to America and do some research on diners. You know, I've, I've done as much research as I can from books, et cetera. Um, so I went off and, and travelled, uh, went through LA and, and ended up in Seattle. I had a friend up in Seattle, um, Steve Bell, living in Belltown. And... I uh, got exposed to Starbucks and a whole sort of whole new um, emerging um, specialty coffee industry um, on the west coast in Seattle, and it was it was fantastic. And that inspired me to. to I, I saw a particular low cost operation. It was a, um, an engineer from Boeing had created a um, an espresso cart at uh, on on Fifth Avenue. Uh, under the monorail, and it was called Monorail Espresso, and it was you know like you see popcorn or pretzels or coffee in New York sold from a cart. This was espresso. Um, so I came back to New Zealand, and the the diner project didn't work out, and um, so I headed back to head back to Seattle, and and that's where I sort of got inspired to to think about. Um, Coming, you know, I, at that stage I was I was chefing and and being a bit of a ski bum and living out of a suitcase. And I was about at that point I was about twenty nine. I went, well, oh, twenty nine. I better do something, you know, sensible with my life. And and that was it. I came back to New Zealand and and created um, espresso carts. And so, tell me about those first that that first cart and getting off the ground. Uh, and and buy a coffee cart. Was it kind of like um, all? <laughs> Burnished chrome and uh, rivets and stuff. Is that, that the kind of look? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I was paying attention to design and detail and aesthetics. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the the first expression of some, you know, of, of the, the creativity part of, of um, starting a, a, a barrow business, really. Um, and then moved quite quickly into into printing, designing our own cups, and and um, you know, it was. It was a. Um, I remember the first day we ever traded it was. Um, it was a. Uh, there was an auction for the um, John Pappas tiles that were were, were taken out of the ATA centre. It looked like somebody had gone in there and graffitied the whole bathrooms, and and um, uh, the Auckland City Council didn't like them, so they ripped them out and they were auctioning them off to raise some funds. But I wheeled the card out into the middle of ATA Square and plugged it in. Um, I didn't have a license. Um, but um, off we went, and, and we had a, a line out. We had a queue uh, all day. I went, okay, we're onto something here. And um, it took me a little while to find a home for it, but we ended up at Victoria Park Market, and then subsequently we built another espresso cart, and we, that landed at the the quad at Auckland University, and we had them both running, um, and all day long queues outside. It was fantastic. Uh, what was the landscape like at the moment? Like, were, were other people doing, was it, you know, espresso as we'd know it, extracted kind of uh, carry on? Okay, good question. I, um, this is a sort of unusual reference, but it, it, um, I always think, well, this was prior to McDonald's being open for breakfast. Um, and um, most people were were having a cup of tea, toast and marmalade, and then running out the door. So they'd had they'd had an egg or breakfast already. Um, and I, one of the carts I set up in Aotea, no, not in Aotea, in Queen Elizabeth Square downtown, I thought, I'll catch all the people coming off the ferry going to the office. But they'd already had breakfast. They'd had a cup of tea and uh, eaten. So I, I, I sort of, cut, that cart really catered more for the tourists, the people that had more leisure time and were milling around. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, things have changed. This was pre-cafe scene. In terms of getting all of the things you need to have uh, great coffee going, what was the bean supply like? And you know, because building out an industry, you're not just kind of educating the market, are you? You're having to create supply, 
for what you have to produce. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, initially I was buying um, roasted coffee off um, uh, Syro Coffee, uh, it was a, a little roaster in Parnell, and um, but I was never happy with the flavour, the quality, uh, and I and I quite quickly moved to okay, well I'm probably going to have to roast my own. So the search was on for a, for a um, a roaster. I went and visited my friend in, in, in Sydney, Tony Pappas, and and he said, "Oh, mate, this, the Hernandez brothers around the corner they roast the they roast coffee." So off I tried to went around the corner, um, got chatting to them, and they said, "Oh, we've got uh, we've got a roaster on the back doorstep," and I went out there and had a look at it. It was in pieces, and um, and I and I ended up acquiring it and boxing it up and shipping it back to New Zealand, and um, and I. Had to pull the asbestos out of it, rebuild it, put new burners in it. Um, I had, a, had an engineering friend of mine uh, assist me, so I learned a lot about uh, roasters in the early early um, days. And then went off and acquired three bags of raw of green beans, and that was the you know the early stages and the beginning of a of a thirty year journey of um, discovering coffee and um, and um, you know it's, it really has been a a flavoured journey for sure. You know, we're celebrating thirty years. Of, you know, t- tonight actually, we uh, we kick off a thirty year celebration, and um, it really has been about. It's not so much about coffee, but uh, people, flavour, and innovation. That's really what this journey has been all about. Tell me about setting up those sites, like the roastery and the first cafes, as you you kind of um, followed a, a two pronged approach of having your own outlets and also supplying to cafes and the like, didn't you? And was that, was that a bit unique? Um, well, initially, it was uh, we, we, we weren't being taken seriously with the carts. So they, we, they were sort of transient units. You, you know, there, there wasn't a shop. So um, once we once we acquired the roaster and, and um, I had an old old paint shed in, in um, just downtown Auckland and, and we rebuilt it there and we started roasting our coffee there, I, I realised quite early on to have some some presence, some consumer presence. We needed a shop, so um, Victoria Street uh, was our first coffee shop and roastery. Um, we grew out of that quite quickly and um, upgraded our roaster and moved to a larger roaster and then a larger premise. We're, we're now and still in um, the Browns Mill building in, um, in uh, just off Victoria Street, but. Uh, that's that's when we moved in there. It was a massive space, and I, I never realised that we would be sort of bulging at the seams. But that's the case now. We're, we're probably due for a, a relocation due to production size and people. And yeah, yeah. it's a great kind of <laughs> business model, isn't it? In that um, you have your roaster going, and it spits the smell out into the surrounding area, and then that kind of pulls people in for their for their hits. Yeah, it's the. the the um the smell of roasting coffee if it's not treated can be a bit acrid but um yeah it's certainly a little bit of a beacon to to a coffee shop but uh, I think I think we've been we've been we've been business to business and building a building a brand over the last thirty years and I guess that's that's the sort of entrepreneurial spirit that that um, I've been been driving um, personally but it's taken a lot of great people and. Um, to get to where we are today, you know, in your opening, you know, you mentioned all those locations, and we do have seven uh, roasteries around the world today. Hmm. Yeah, should we, should we look at that? Like, so Australia in around about two thousand, which um, you know, starting a cafe and 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 coffee business here, but heading over the ditch to Australia. What was what was the plan there? Um, yeah, it was what we, well, I I created a. Uh, an alternative company. It was All Press International, and and um, and a good friend of mine, Tony Pappas, who I went to Westlake Boys with. Um, well, we, we kind of went to Westlake Boys. We probably spent more time wagging, going surfing, than actually going to going to college. But um, Tony had a successful restaurant in in Sydney and knew the market, and um, so we decided to partner up. Um, and Tony, Tony led that um, that market, and um, we, we acquired another small roaster similar to the one that I initially purchased out of Sydney and dragged back to Auckland. 
um, and off we went, you know, just um, building our recipes, building our knowledge. Um, you know, it, it's, it, Tony's a fantastic uh, uh, startup guy. He's just got so much energy and, and drive and enthusiasm and, um, and um, yeah, we, we, you know, with, with time, uh, we built a, a great wholesale customer base and, um, and then really started communicating with the consumer as well and so, so building our um, brand equity from a, from a consumer's perspective. Um, the quality of coffee in Australia at the time was relatively poor, so and we we knew there was an emerging market for for better quality um, in terms of equipment, training, raw material. Um, so, you know, and it was very it was a very sensitive uh, market around pricing, but the but the people in the coffee industry at the time. Um, didn't see the emerging market of people that would, would pay pay more for a better product and service, and that was our that was our opening really. And how about the UK? As it's it's such a kind of like jolt of uh, pride you get as a Kiwi, and then you you're wandering around you know trendy East London, and then you see this beautiful big outpost uh, of of all press right there. Right, they're drinking our they're coffee t- here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Used to be Steinlager, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it is. It, it, there, I was having a coffee in Redchurch Street the other day, and, and I got chatting to a Kiwi, and, and there is a lot of pride in, um, in, in, in what we've done. You know, people really um, have an, an I don't know the, the we've built we've built a company around people and values um, that that coffee drinkers, independent thinkers, and coffee drinkers just seem to be attracted to. Um, I, I, I th- yeah, I'm, I'm rambling now. I've probably had too much coffee, but uh. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you're good. You're good. How important is the people factor there? As with Hospo, you have um, such interesting people who come through and be your front of house and your relationship managers with all of the cafes and those first people that that set up the outposts in in a Japan or a in a UK kind of situation. Oh. Simon, it's all about people. It's you know, it's, it's you know, coffee. Coffee took a back seat quite early on, and I realised that um, that uh, hiring the right people, uh, empowering those people, um, developing and training them it was a critical part of um, of building a brand, building building a coffee brand. Flavour was still critical and still is, is a high priority, but um, without good people, you you can't do any of this. And um, so I think we've we have built a real solid value based um, organisation that that um, looks after its people, looks after its customers, looks after its suppliers. Um, I think we're we're a conscious organisation um, and a values based organisation. One of the really interesting things about coffee is it's this amazing blend of urbanism. You know, it's at the the heart of kind of dense cities, people getting their coffee in the day. Uh, but it's also this this massive commodity that comes from some of the the most exotic and far flung and um and, and different places in the world as well. And you've got that link between kind of design and urbanism, very kind of like modern civilization and very different ways of living. It, it is a it is it is an interesting blend. It, it's a it's such a um, and it's, there's something quite magical about coffee in in so many respects. Um, you know, there's the it's a catalyst for a lot of um, thinking and consideration, and um, you know, it turns up in in the best of places. Um, but yeah, it's um, well. That's a that's was that's quite an in depth question yeah, you yeah, just t- asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. T- tell us tell us about kind of building those relationships with the suppliers and that <coughs> other side of coffee that people don't see behind the the sacks that arrive in the store. Um, yeah, the, the the raw material you know it comes from exotic places like Costa Rica and Brazil and Colombia and and um, you know parts of Indonesia where we where we um, acquire our coffee. Um, when we first considered going to the UK, we were we were very concerned about um, the United Kingdom's propensity to be, you know, really on top of 
whether it's um, whether it's animal tested um, drugs or um, you know they just they just have a propensity to want to know um, that the the the, co- the coffee or the product that they're consuming is you know of a of a fair nature. So um, we we did we did consider uh, creating our own fair trade mark, and then and then we then we went well if we do that then um, there's issues around other products. Um, actually, it was it was we were considered putting one fair trade product into our mix, and then we went well that just makes all of our other product suspect. So. Um, we went well. We'll create our own mark. We'll, we'll create our own standards, and we'll, we'll go to mark. We'll go to origin. We'll, we'll inspect the um, through through the exporters. We'll inspect the um, farms and the plantations that we would be buying off. Check their uh, whether you know what sort of conditions they had for the workers, and um, it's a very, it's a very complicated, um, broad subject. The prospect of of what is fairly traded, and then you start imposing Western. Values into into um, you know small villages in Colombia and it, it's just not real. Um, but we 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 um, ended up deciding that um, that we wanted people to to um, trust our brand and and believe in what we did. And um, so we he ended up turning off the our separate mark. Um, and and we're buying we're we're buying. Very good quality coffees where we we, we pay a, a high differential over the, what the, the New York Sea might be. Um, so the, the coffees that we were buying have had added value to them, and the, the farmers and the exporters are all getting um, fairly rewarded for their for their work and their and their superior product. Um, yeah. Are there times that you've thought? You know, with the expansion and now operating in all of these different markets, that that things have stretched too far, or have there been times where it's been hard? Stretched too far in what respect? Oh, in in in, in growth or operations or ahead I, of the market? Yeah, well, I guess that's the I guess that's the challenge with growth, and um, how do you how do you retain a value based organisation as you grow and as as different people move into the organisation? Um, we we employ about three hundred people globally now, a, across um, six different territories. Um, so that the you know we've been concentrating and and developing and investing in a lot of leadership initiatives within the organisation and um, making sure that people people front up and that they're real and that they're capable of working together and making good decisions and. Um, you know, the, the whole culture of the organisation it, it has it, it is it, it's robust in some respects, but then fragile in others. So, I think being being conscious and aware of um, small insidious changes that might change that value based culture is um, in, important for me. Um, and and we can mitigate that by the way we hire and who we hire and um, what sort of leadership we have in the organisation. But I think, you know, whilst Tony and I, you know, this is thirty years of coffee, sixty years of my life, half my life, um, and th- th- there's probably more to life than coffee, and, and it's natural that you know that um, I'm considering other other stuff in my life at, at this point. But it's we might be stepping back, but we're, we're not letting go, and and what we won't let go of is making sure that the the culture and the values of the organisation as we grow. Remains as Tony and I um, feel that it's important to um, hold on to those values, and, and and I think we can do that if you if you're conscious about it. If it's a value for you, then you can. And you know, we could be we could be 900 people um, and still have that. How much of this um, growth around the world has been riding a wave, and how much, especially in kind of the the local market, but also overseas? You know, like. It wasn't that easy to get great coffee in London, which is kind of bananas to think. But now it's it's very easy to get great coffee in, in a lot of these cities. How much of it has been riding a wave and how much of it is have you felt that it's kind of creating the wave? Well, the specialty coffee industry, they, they talk about waves. I don't pay too much attention to them, but I think we might be on the fifth wave. I'm not sure what Starbucks was, the second wave. Um, 
Yeah, I think in in this part of the world we we were um, we were creating some of that movement as well. We we I think we had a significant influence on the quality of coffee that you can drink in New Zealand and Australia today. Britain, the UK, um, you know, they they drank a very strong um, tea for a long time, and then they didn't have the independent cafe. They had the, the chains got in there very quickly, and they you know they took up took up all the real estate on the high street, and and they were just dishing up swill. But the consumer didn't really have any any comparison or um, any reference point. Um, so. So the Londoners were drinking a lot of bad coffee for a while there, um, and today that's changed dramatically through um, what we've done and some some great local British roasters. Um, the standard of coffee in the UK generally now um, is very good. Did people tell you you were <coughs> bananas to try, like these things that you've been doing here? Bananas? No, I didn't. No one ever really. Um, but. When, yeah, nobody ever really had a negative approach or consideration around what we were, mm. what we were doing. And would you have guessed that you know the flat white, which is so associated with you know the, the Auckland, the New Zealand cafe, cafe scene, would end up being kind of the the number one thing advertised and drunk around the world in your Starbucks and your places right. like that? Well, I think it was. I think I think the flat white light, the flat white or the latte has been around for a long time. I think you know the. The Italians have been drinking a flat white, just called something different for a long time. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that 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 term and the name has gone gone global. It's a it's a great drink if it's made well. Um, but I think there's a few different interpretations on what actually a flat white might be. I'm sure there's a lot of kind of uh, <laughs> a lot of story and lore amongst coffee makers around that. Uh, and, and in terms of like you know advice for you know people interested in starting their own ventures like this, you know do you, do you see other areas that have the energy and interest of coffee emerging today? And what kind of advice do you give um, people wanting to start out and, and make a business? Right, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, not, I was. Uh I was back in the day. I just um, was was passionate about what I was doing, and I was relentless. And there was there were probably a number of opportunities to do something else or something in addition. And I really I really stuck to my knitting. Um, and I, I guess the other aspect is, um, oh, you know, continuity continuity of what you're doing is is critical. Um, and and it's going to take some time. You you don't. You don't well. Perhaps in the digital world, you can create a business overnight, but I think I think good businesses you need to build. You know, it takes time, um, and and building you know one relationship, uh, the next relationship, um, one employer, the next employee. Um, building a business is different from um, having a, a, a massive overnight digital success on. I'm, and I'm sure that's possible too. Mm. And how do you define success? Looking back on the thirty years, um, it's never it's never been fiscal. Uh, that's just a, an outcome, I think. Um, success. I think the success for me is the the way that we support so many people and communities. Um, we we have the capacity, um, particularly now that we've we're a lot larger to to change behaviour, influence thinking. Um, take a stand on on the community, the environment. Um, so, defining success. Um, yeah, I think um, personal success, being satisfied and and um, healthy, and um, having great relationships. Uh, that's that's probably about one of the um, pointers in successful. Well, success really. Yeah. yeah. And how are you marking the thirty years? Um, we we have a celebration tonight. Uh, we have a studio space at, uh, at the Browns Mill Building in Victoria um, Quarter. Um, we have a we have a sort of a, an exhibition taking you through the thirty years, um, the early stages. We've recreated the initial, the, the first cart. Um, we've we've resurrected some old logos. We've um, but. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. I haven't. I ha- it's only just opened. I haven't really 
walked through it and contemplated the whole um, whole thirty years. But there's audio visual. Um, it's it's a. I think there'll be a lot of Kiwis interested in in looking at that journey. Um, yeah. Ah, that's so cool. Well, thank you very much, Michael Orpress of Orpress Coffee, for coming and sharing your story today. You're welcome. Thanks, Simon. Thank you very much to Alice for producing, and thank you very much for having us along in your ears. If you are a fan and follower of The Spinoff, make sure you check out The Spinoff Members, uh, a program where you're able to get behind and support and choose and shape the investigative journalism that The Spinoff provides. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spinoff and Callahan Innovation. From the Spinoff Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.